Hear now from the gospel according to Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at that saying and trying to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, just as your spirit brooded over the face of the deep at the dawn of creation, descended upon your only begotten at his baptism, and came upon his virgin mother to bring about the miracle of his birth, we pray that you would hover and brood over us now. Help us in this hour and always to hear the silent whisper of your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. We are called by love to live in a house of yes. We're called by love to live a life of yes. I've only done this once before, and I think it was about six years ago. Um, I've never Only then, I think, have I ever based a whole series of chapel talks on on a single book. It's usually more, way more random with me. (laughs) Um, Carla Waterman, uh, who uh, was a part of our alumni then, had just written a book called Songs of Ascent, Songs of Yes. And so I thought it might be fun to revisit that. The book, uh, Songs of Ascent, covers five life lessons in the, vir- in the life of the Virgin Mary, five songs in her life, if you will, and we want to talk about the Virgin Mary this morning. And I think that that's, for, for evangelicals, I think it's at least a little bit mischievous, if not a little bit, um, 
I don't know what the right word would be, but I feel like we're getting away with something, talking about the Virgin Mary for the next five mornings together, and it's not even Christmas time. <laughs> Romans might do that. Even the Orthodox might do that. But evangelicals, not so much. Um, but let's talk about the Virgin Mary and her songs of ascent. What do we really know about her? What do we know about the Virgin Mary? Not much. This, uh, my bride snapped this yesterday, sometime in the 80s. Uh, our anniversary, wedding anniversary is in the month of July, and so uh, several times through the years, we've gone down to Cancun and spent a few days on the beach together to celebrate our anniversary. And we were on one of those trips in the 80s, and we were in a little artisan shop, and there was this sterling sculpture of the Virgin Mother, and I liked its ambiguity of not having a face, not having detail, just an outline, a, a form, and I, it reminded me of the fact that, we, that she's so much a mystery to us. We really, do, we know a little bit from the scripture, we know a little bit from, or we might know a little bit from tradition, and most of it we fill in the blanks with our imagination. And literally, um, there are two, I think, and, and feel free to correct me if you, odds are many in this room know more about this than I do, and so feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I detect two general schools of thought about the virgin. One, and you encounter this with, with Roman Catholics and the Orthodox and um, some biblical scholars and so forth, one is dwelling on the Proto-Evangelium of James. I tend towards that camp, although there are some things in the Proto-Evangelium of James that are not consonant with Scripture. Scripture trumps that whoever wrote that uh, book when, uh, when they disagree. But that's one school of thought. The other school of thought, how many are familiar with the church choir musical Two from Galilee? few? Yeah. And it's the more romantic story. And we, I pulled this image of um, Keisha Castle Hughes, who played the Virgin in the movie The Nativity Story. And it, it draws too much on the romantic end for my, for my persuasion, but I liked it, and I really loved the casting of her. You might have seen her before that in a movie called Whale Rider. She's a, a brilliant young actor, and she really, uh, I think, presented the Virgin well. But what aspirations might this young Jewish girl have had? What things would she have longed for in her life? I think it's fair to speculate she might have imagined getting married at some point, a, a wedding, a, hat, a joyous wedding. She might have thought about hoping she would have a successful marriage to a good man, children, grandchildren. Maybe she yearned, like all of the rest of her countrymen, for the overthrow of the Roman oppressors. Maybe she longed, as pure as her heart seemed to be, maybe she longed for a renewal, a revival, of purity and truth in her religion. Maybe she longed for respectability and a good reputation. And then comes the call. An angel shows up. You, you, hail favored one. You have found favor with God. Listen to how similar that is to the call of Jesus at his baptism in the Jordan. You are my son, the one I dearly love, and I have great favor. You have great favor with me. I am so pleased with you. Mary really hadn't done anything, and the angel says, you you have found favor with the Almighty. 
just because you're you. He has made you in his image. He is really pleased. He loves you. You. Just as the Spirit of God brooded over the face of the deep at the beginning of creation, at the dawn, just as the Spirit descended on the Son in the Jordan at his baptism, here the Spirit descends upon Mary and brings about a miraculous birth. But then it gets complicated. She starts thinking about this like we always do. The word of the Lord comes to us, a call, a nudge, an opportunity, a prompting, and then it gets complicated and we say, how can this be? Have you ever had that happen? Back when I was thinking about leaving Houston and moving to Nashville, I was torn, this was 1989, I was torn in two for about a year, year and a half, because I really felt like I desperately wanted to be involved in ministry, more hands-on ministry, rather than just making music that ministered to people, helping others make music that ministered to people. And yet, I felt called to go to Nashville to continue making that music. It just tore, I was saying, how can this be? The, the, the church had already ordained me there, but they wouldn't commission me to go to Nashville to do this. They, were trying, they, they wanted me to come on staff. I was torn. I was between the proverbial rock and a hard place, between the Scylla and Kybridus. I was torn in two. And I was saying, Lord, how can this be? How can I do what I know you've called me to do, but I can't be where I think you're calling me to be? I eventually heard the Lord say, go, and I went. And the CEO of my company said, Daryl, look. When I got there, he said, look, I know you're torn over this issue. I know you want to go on staff with that church. And he said, look, you are going to always get your work done. I have no doubt about that. I know your work ethic. I know you're going to get your work done. So he said, why don't you think about spending 80% of your time getting this music made? And you take the other 20% and you give it away however you want to. Hop on a tour bus, bus and go teach a Bible study with an artist. Uh, take the bread and wine on the bus and do communion with them. If you need to show up and baptize somebody, if you need to go wherever and minister to whomever, don't worry about it. Just give that part of yourself away. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. The how could this be was already worked out. The answer to that was already worked out. God knew what was in Stan Moser's heart. He was going to cut me loose to do what I felt called to do and yet still be who I had to be. We move from simplistic to complicated to simple. And this talk really is about the simplicity, the song of simplicity in the Virgin Mother's life. We always start, when, when you got here, whenever, whenever you're, the on-ramp brought you here, you probably were, felt in a simplistic place. You didn't know all that much about all this stuff that was coming down the pike and flooding your mind and your heart. It's like, what is you, you, it? It's like a fish out of water, it's like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. Anytime you start the learning curve on anything new, you, you come at it from a very simplistic place. And then you, you encounter it, and you think, how can this be? This is not going to work. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to work. And then the Spirit broods over you and begins to work in your heart and mind and soul, and you move to the simple. Yes. Let it be to me according to your word. Let the impossible that you just described, the unattainable, let it be to me as you've said. I, I give up. I yield. Yes. Yes, Lord, yes. And then starts the virgin's emptying of herself, letting go of all of her ambitions, all of her hopes, because she's swept up into a much grander story than she could have ever imagined. And when we get to that yes, 
we begin our kenosis of emptying our vain ambitions, our silly hopes, the things that we've imagined that would be so ideal for ourselves, and we get swept up into a grander story. Because as we empty ourselves, we are filled up with him. Please stand for the prayers.